thank you very much for the invitation. I'm, I'm very honored to speak here today and also quite excited about the theme uh, of this conference. Uh, I have to admit, this is the first time that I'm giving an online talk to such a big audience, so uh, I hope all will go well. Yeah, the title of my talk today is Language Technologies and Hypothesis Testing. And uh, rather than giving some recent results of my own research, I've been thinking a little bit about how we are sharing our tools and technologies in the community. I've been thinking about that for a long time. And I wanted to share uh, some of those ideas and uh, what I think would be very interesting to do in the near future. And uh, I was hoping that uh, the conference also with the, some of the cafes and the discussion sessions that are planned would also give some chance to hear your ideas uh, about this. So, Claire and Eric, the Common Language Research and Technology Infrastructure. Now, one of the goals of, of Claren, as you all know, is to make language technology tools available to scholars, uh, researchers, uh, students, and um, citizen scientists from all disciplines, and especially from the humanities and social sciences. And when I first started uh, doing anything with Claren, it was actually my time back in Berlin, I was helping with the Metanet publications that some of you remember. Um, these were publications that for all European countries, all countries involved in Clarence, published uh, the status of language technologies in the official languages uh, of the countries. And I remember that for most languages, there was already quite a bit of technology available uh, and it was also getting more accessible, but there were still very few applications using them. And the message of most of these publications are, okay, we're, we're getting there, but we really need to invest more. Now, looking at the Claren tools today, um, you see over a thousand uh, results of, of tools and resources that are shared through Claren, corpora, services, lexical conceptual resources, and language descriptions. And also you see that more and more people outside of our field are making use of our tools. So I think that uh, the Claren mission has become extremely successful over the last uh, couple of years and also thanks to many members of the community who've done a great job of making their tools more available and easier to use. Um, but of course, I mean, having them, making them easy to use does not always guarantee that people really know how to use them. And that is one of the things that I would uh, like to talk about today. So I will start this talk with um, a talk or a part of a talk that I've been giving to people in humanities conferences and social sciences uh, conferences where I've been um, invited as a guest to talk about language technology. Um, even though I think some of those things will be very familiar to, to you because these are also sometimes things that we as language technology experts don't realize that the people who are using our tools uh, do not know. Uh, before I start, um, I just wanted to point out that I assumed for in preparing this talk that most people in the audience uh, are familiar with language technology and also its challenges. Uh, I hope that uh, for those of you who are maybe a bit more new, it is still possible to follow the main ideas. Um, if you want to have more detail, you think, okay, I could follow the story, but some of the details were difficult, please let me know and I'll be happy to share um, some publications or some material that was prepared for people who have more humanities or social science background who are more users of language technologies than uh, developers. Okay, um, so language technologies for digital humanities and social sciences. So first of all, I think there are many possibilities for people outside our field to use our tools. So uh, when there are skeptics who say, well, a machine can never read language as deeply and understand as thoroughly what a text says as I can. Of course, they're right, but that doesn't mean that there are, not, there are no interesting things they can do with language technologies. And on the other hand, we also have to make sure that we warn people that how good it sometimes uh, may look, there is no magic. So you cannot just take a tool and then apply it to a corpus and look at a pattern and then publish and say, okay, I found this and this is most definitely true. You have to be a little bit careful to make sure that what you get from your machine is also correct. So sometimes there's people who are very enth enthusiastic about what we can do and we have to tell them, yes, we can do a lot, but be a little bit more careful. So what can we do? 
language technology can handle more data than you can if you just read all the text by yourself. We can also do things where we find patterns that a human would not notice, which you see, for instance, with distribution models, where we look at word use that changes or becomes closer or further apart. You may notice some of these things when you just read text from different time periods, but not the more subtle things, or there would also be changes in your models that you would otherwise not notice. And I think another uh, big advantage of what we're doing is that we can support systematic analysis. So if you read sometimes studies from, uh, especially in the late 70s, 80s, which was quite popular that uh, a scholar or researcher would read text themselves and would count things, um, and it would be just one scholar doing this. The fact that you choose to use language technology or even consider trying to use language technology forces you to be very specific about what you want to identify and what the criteria are. Even if uh, in the end you don't manage to do it with language technology, but you still have human annotators doing this for creating a gold standard. Just the fact that you're creating a gold standard already forces the researcher or scholar to be much more specific than in the past. So I think those are uh, really big gains, especially if you then can also support it with language technology. But there are also a couple of things that language technology does not guarantee, even though people very often believe that they do. So language technology does not guarantee that analysis are more reliable than human analyses. It also does not guarantee that the analyses are better because they're applicable. And you can also not be sure, be certain that the errors that our tools make do not matter because the amount of data compensates for them. Now, all these three claims are claims that I've made, heard people make um, from the social sciences and humanities but sometimes also people from computational linguistics while selling their tools say, yes, it's going to be more reliable, it's going to be better, our things are replicable. And I'll say a little bit more why that is not always the case in a bit. But before that, I just want to share one guarantee that we all know that language technology has. And that is that there will be errors. There might be a many, there might be few, but it's not going to get everything correct, no matter how good our tools are. Now let's get back to these three things that we cannot guarantee. So, is it more reliable? Well, of course, computers are better at counting. So if you're really counting something, counting the occurrence of a word or some, or you want to create a language model, of course, the computer is going to do that better than a person actually counting them. It's also the case that a computer will make decisions systematically and it doesn't want a specific outcome. So um, I can tell from my own uh, experience, as was mentioned in the introduction, I ha have a past as a syntactician and looking at Dutch word order that varies a lot. There's a lot of gray area there and it's very difficult not to say if something is kind of okay and according to your theory, it should be okay to say, yeah, that's kind of okay. And if your theory says it's not okay to think, yeah, it does kind of sound kind of weird. It's very, very difficult to turn that off. And of course, a computer doesn't have that problem. But the fact that the computer doesn't want a specific outcome does not mean that computers or computer models cannot contain a bias or ampl amplify a bias that was put in there through the training data that it used to build its model. And then the other point is that computers are still much worse at interpreting natural language than people are. We evaluate on human interpretation. And even though our recent models can do very impressive things, they still make mistakes that people would never make. And these things um, are, I think, quite obvious if you know how our tools work, but it goes wrong quite a lot. So I, I once saw a publication that was written by computational linguists that said that uh, that encouraged people from social science in this case to use language technology because it was more reliable. And in the same page, they reported the inter-annotator agreement of their gold standard and the F-score. And looking at those numbers, they did really not suggest that their model was more reliable than people because they had quite a high inter-annotator agreement and the F-score was okay, it was not bad, but clearly lower. But still, this claim of the tool being more reliable was there. 
So this is really something where we have to be very careful because maybe some of us think, well, that's odd giving the inter inter agreement an F-score, but someone from social science that may not realize that because they don't have our training. Then rep replicability. So that one is a little bit more doubtful. In theory, our experiments are replicable, but in practice, not necessarily. I think we've all, with a couple of years of experience, have had situations where we wanted to build up on someone else's research, and we just did not manage to get the same numbers, to get the same results as were reported in the original paper. Um, but okay, um, very often they also are. We're getting much better as a community in sharing tools, in explaining how things were trained. But then the next question is, just the fact that it's more replicable, does that also mean that it's more reliable? Because if you just manage to replicate the same biased or same poor results over and over again, that doesn't really make it better. Just the fact that you can reproduce it doesn't make it good. So this is only helpful if you can actually use it to either verify results on a new set of data, or if you basically know that your, your results have high quality and you can replace them or you can replicate them, then replicability becomes an asset. Um, I also would like to point out that what we very often forget is that what we do when we create gold, st gold standards and we have humans annotated, uh, annotate our data, those studies are also replicable. Because if we have well-defined annotation guidelines, and we've shown that trained annotators get good inter-annotator agreement, a new annotator is, of course, not going to annotate exactly the same, but is again going to annotate with good inter-annotator agreement. We should probably have the same patterns in the data. And you should probably also, you will probably also get a comp comparable inter-annotator agreement when you annotate similar data or the same data again. Then finally, the claim that data compensates for the errors that are made. So in natural language processing, we typically establish the accuracy or the F-score based on some ground truth, and we report that. And the idea behind that claim is, well, if you have a decent F-score, the things that go wrong are just noise. Now, that can be true in many cases, that it's just noise and that the patterns that you extract from a large amount of data still hold and that they can be used to verify hypothesis or to provide evidence. But it kind of depends on what errors are made more than the amount of errors that are made. And whether these errors matters, matter or not, that will actually depend on what the person using the outcome of the tools is doing with that. And I will give you three examples of that. The first example is uh, the first time that I came across uh, this and it was very obvious. It, it's an example I've used before, so some of you may already know it. Um, it's the example of disambiguating locations. So this is in the project biography net. We had Dutch biographical dictionaries. And these are resources that describe people who lived in the past. In this case, these are Dutch people um, who were either from the Netherlands or lived in the Netherlands in a, a long time, for a long time. And um, these resources in, in BiographyNet are so, very often very old. So the biggest ones are uh, over 100 years old, over 150 years old. And then what do we want to know? Well, the dictionary or the description mentions Amsterdam. And we want to know whether that is Amsterdam, New York, or Amsterdam, the Netherlands. Now, given that this is a resource about Dutch people, it is usually, or it's maybe, I would actually be relatively confident to say that it's always in this particular resource, Amsterdam, the Netherlands, or at least definitely not Amsterdam, New York. So what is the tactic that uh, is relatively easy to implement and gets you a very high accuracy? If you have an ambiguous location name, prefer the location in the Netherlands. Otherwise, prefer the location near the Netherlands, because someone from the Netherlands is much more likely to go to Dusseldorf, Germany, than to Dusseldorf somewhere in America, because that's the, the reason that a lot of European city names are ambiguous. There's also villages in America with the same name. Uh, and otherwise, take the one that is closely related to the Netherlands, so, so a city in one of the former colonies. 
Now, um, looking at how well that does on a, uh, on a small subset, we get an accuracy of about 97%. And this is much higher than the accuracy of most of our tools. I think maybe part of speech tagging does better for most languages, but not much else. So this is a very, very high accuracy. Now, can we claim that these 3% that we get wrong because of this relatively simple algorithm is not a problem? That depends on what the historian wants to know. So let's look at the first question of the historian. Where or in what region, region were most officials in The Hague, where the Dutch government is located, born throughout, let's say, the 18th century? We'll have a lot of people from that time in these dictionaries, probably most of the people who were uh, important officials in The Hague. And um, these couple of things that were not a location in the Netherlands, but a location overseas, will probably not affect what the biggest group is. It's very, very unlikely. So in that case, probably these 3% being noise is not a problem. But what if the historian wants to know this? What was the connection between officials in the former Dutch colonies and the Netherlands? How often did they travel home? Did they have direct relations with Dutch locations? Well, now all of a sudden this simple algorithm may become a problem. Because of course, the former Dutch colonies, especially in the old times, had uh, location names that were inspired by Dutch cities as well. So here, the risk that um, the city that is mentioned or the place that is mentioned is not the place in the Netherlands, but a location in nowadays Indonesia or, or Suriname is much, much bigger here. So the historian must know that that was the algorithm that was used and must have the possibility to correct for this somehow. Next example from social sciences. So this is actually work that has been carried out by some uh, communication scientists who are very uh, proficient in using NLP. And what they wanted to do is they wanted to find out what the best way is to detect sentiment in Dutch newspaper headlines. And they compared human annotation uh, by uh, trained um, students, um, crowd annotations, machine learning and uh, sentiment dictionaries. And here you see the outcome of the machine learning algorithms that they tried. And I just wanted to highlight the things that you uh, see marked here. So if you look at these results, you'll notice that both positive and negative sentiment has higher precision than recall. But also what is probably important for a lot of use cases, precision and recall are much closer to each other for the positive class than for the negative class. And in particular, for the naive base algorithm approach, you see that the precision of the positive uh, class is higher and the recall of the negative class is higher. So basically, again, depending on what the user wants to know, this may matter a lot. This may be something you want to correct for. So let's say that we want to know whether a newspaper is positive or negative about a certain topic. And we see, we, we're going to count the, the positive uh, headlines and the negative headlines uh, over time, right? the, the exit words, but it should be headlines. Now, what you will probably get if let's say the one on the left is the gold, you see that it starts out with the green line uh, representing positive uh, sentiment and the red line being negative sentiment that about halfway through the period that is under investigation, it's going to be more negative than positive. But what will the system do? Well, first of all, since precision is higher than recall, it will underestimate both results, but it will do this um, more for uh, precision than for recall, or for, for positive than for negative. So you will see that the place where the shift occurs will be different. So the fact that these precision and recall are different for both classes directly impacts the outcome of the research question. So again, the people using these tools need to know this. Final example. Um, this is uh, some research from Marta Sapp and colleagues about hate speech detection. And what they found is that um, the, both the crowd, but also the classifiers, have a tendency to overclassify um, tweets from uh, Afro-Americans as hate speech. 
And you can also imagine why that is problematic for all kinds of reasons. So that's problematic for democracy, for free speech. And of course, if people want to use this for research, it can also interfere on all kinds of ways. So once again, it's not so much the F score that matters on, uh, on the, uh, of the outcome of this uh, classifier, but what matters is what is actually going wrong. So um, this is the first uh, point where hypotheses matter. The kind of errors and their distribution are very often more important than the number of errors. But what errors or distribution are problematic, that depends on the research question. So is the bias that is introduced interfering with the researcher's hypothesis or not? So if you just want to have a general look at positive, negative sent sentiment or general sentiment increasing or decreasing in a resource, maybe this difference in the social science st study doesn't matter that much, as long as also the precision recall is more or less consistent over time. But if you want to know whether something is more positive or negative, this matters a lot. So back to the Claren mission. Knowing this is making tools available and making them easy enough. Is this enough? Because what actually these studies show is that working together is, is very, very important. And uh, now I just also want to take this opportunity to uh, congratulate Francesca and Tomasz. And I was also very pleased to hear that one of the reasons that uh, for receiving the award is also the, the collaboration with people from the humanities. So these kind of collaborations are very, very important to make sure that our tools are used in the right way. Um, and there are many examples of that from people in, within Claren. Uh, I cannot name them all. Uh, of course, in the Netherlands, we have Claria, where we have a work package where historians uh, define what needs to happen and we provide the tools. Uh, there's many, many nice examples of this. But how can we bring this maybe uh, a bit further and make, make this more systematic in our community and maybe also in Claren. So let's say if, if next to the, the goal of sharing tools and making them available, we also make it very explicit that that goal comes with providing clear insights in how these tool, tools work. And then I don't mean how to run them, I mean how they are made. So what kind of technologies were used? And what was the training data in the case of a machine learning tool? What are the properties of the evaluation data? And of course, also the outcome of the evaluation and preferably that would not just be accuracy and F score, but also some of the outcomes of systematic error analysis. And most importantly, it would be very good if we actually systematically share methodology for using our tools. Because then uh, social scientists and humanities, if they have some use case we didn't think of, if they are doing something where the bias that our tools may introduce was not something we took into account and may not have come out of our error analysis. At least they know, okay, I can evaluate the tools myself uh, on my own corpus. I can carry out an error analysis to see if there are errors that matter for my use case following this procedure. Uh, this comes also with some challenges, of course. I mean, the, the methodology can be shared. We, we know that we have that information. But especially thinking about what we need to share is not very trivial. Um, so I mentioned that this research from the social scientist was about identifying sentiment in headlines. What I didn't mention is that they were working with about 1000 annotated headlines. This is not very much. So the question is, will these, these outcome, will this outcome, will this also apply to other data? Now, so, and how do we know whether these results are robust? And we know already that changing the domain will affect results so that we wouldn't, none of us would claim that, okay, this has been tested on headlines from the economic news. This is just how well these tools do for all kinds of headlines or for all kinds of text. But in this case, with 1000 examples, can we be even sure about in-domain data? And also in-domain data is also affected by things like time and uh, temporal context. Um, so if you take all that into account, what are the properties of the training and evaluation data that we need to share? It's a little bit more than just the genre and the amount. Um, so how can we do better and how can we find out more about what needs to be shared? And then I come to language technology research. 
If you look at what our field is doing, even though we're getting uh, paying more and more attention to also quality of corpora and evaluation and finding out what our models are doing and why, still a lot of our work is exploratory. So you will find a lot of papers from the last two years that just look at what BIRD does for this task or um, compares a domain specific BIRD to generic BIRD or uh, checks whether multilingual bird is better than a language specifically trained bird. Um, we actually did a small survey with a couple of colleagues of uh, ACL papers from 2019. We looked at over a hundred papers. Only three of them had research questions and none of them had uh, specifically identified hypotheses. And uh, here I come back to the hypotheses again. Um, I think it is actually very important that as a language technology community, we go back to the basis of research and aim at answering research questions and use hypotheses, explicitly defined hypotheses, to explain what we're testing. So an example would be, uh, when does it make sense to use BERT or deep learning rather than traditional machine learning? And if you um, work with the digital humanities and social sciences, you know that this is not an easy question to answer. This impression that you get that BERT will outperform everything is, is not the case if your data is complex, you don't have mu much data, or it's very different from most language use. So an hypothesis would be that this depends on the amount of data that you have for fine tuning. It depends on the type of data, how similar is it to generic language use, but also maybe the available features where were you to use traditional machine learning. And then you might have sub hypothesis. If there's too little data, BERT won't help much and good features will do better. And then you can start testing uh, how much data you would need for BERT to really learn something. Uh, another hypothesis would be with highly domain specific data, BERT will help less to generalize or maybe not at all unless there is enough domain data to retrain BERT. And then again, you can see, okay, so when do I have enough domain specific data to create a domain specific BERT that then can be fine tuned for my specific task? Um, well, one thing that confirms that BERT is not always better uh, for the study that I showed from the social sciences, they also tried BERT and uh, they uh, BERT performed worse than the other machine learning methods. And they asked me what they were doing wrong. And I told them there's nothing wrong. It's just a use case where you need a lot of world knowledge as well. And with 1000 examples, the generalization power of BERT is just not enough to pick up this world knowledge. It cannot learn from these examples that uh, we see uh, employment as something positive and unemployment as something negative. It needs to have specific examples of the kind of things that we see in a positive or negative light uh, in economy to, to, to make use of the language knowledge it has. And this will, of course, be true for many cases in social scientists and humanities. Where we're often dealing with little data or data that is highly specific. Now, of course, this is, uh, this is also a lot of work to do this for all our tools and all the technologies that we're using. But I think there's also a lot to gain because if we do this, we learn more about our models and systems. We can not only learn what system works best, but also why it works best. And if we know why, we also stand a better chance of predicting what the robustness is across data sets, because we know what properties affect our results. And we're also more likely to know about potential biases that an individual model may have. And these first two aspects, these are essential questions for computational linguistics. This is what we want to know. We want to know how language works as a system and how we can model it computationally. So if we understand what our models do, we understand more about modeling language. And these second two questions, based on what we've seen about hypothesis, what goes wrong, how to know whether you can use a model for your data or not, are essential for any discipline that wants to use language technology. So maybe the future Claren will not just be a common language research and technology infrastructure, but also a knowledge platform where we share methodologies. Um, this completes my talk, and I'd be very happy to take questions, but also comments. Thank you very much for your attention. Okay. Thank you 
very much. Uh, and uh, I suggest uh, for your talk, I enjoyed it really a lot. Can please, uh, so uh, thank you. Uh, could people that have uh, a question, uh, please uh, write in the chat so we can, I can give the word to them. Uh, okay, here is uh, the first uh, uh, question from Andres de Uca. In the context of your talk, what do you think about the situation of less resources in languages? Yes, thank you. That's that's indeed a very good question. And of course, the, the examples of, of BERT that I just gave will be a bit more difficult for them. Uh, what I actually think is that this is even more reason to invest in less research languages because we can, uh, can learn a lot from them. I also think that, um, I mean, I, I find it difficult to say uh, what it really means for, for how to get there, because of course, to be able to say something about hypothesis and how good tools are, there has to be a minimum performance. Um, but my guess is that what applies to even all languages, even languages that have high coverage in, in using technologies across disciplines, applies even more to them. Um, I've very often heard people working on extreme, uh, extremely low research languages making rule-based systems. Uh, so until you have enough data to create uh, models, you just can't. I've, I've heard from Miriam Butt, who works a lot with people in Asia for languages where there is just not enough data, digital data available to create even a word embedding model. And they all want to do deep learning, but it's just not possible. So I think uh, this is also one of the things where I think also Claren is very valuable because you can also see that more traditional resources are very useful. And I, I see the same thing even for Dutch, which is not a low research language. Um, there are cases where you want to, with the age discrimination use case, we had we, we really want precision for that. And it, it occurs very, very little. It's just no way to do this well with machine learning. So in the end, sometimes you're really just better off if you have very specific data writing regular expressions, even though the language technology community is not so interested in that. And those kind of things, still building a grammar, building a lexicon are, especially for low research languages, in my view, but I'm not a low research language expert. I have to take, a, there's probably people in the audience who can say much more about that than I can, even more important. Thanks. The second question is uh, from Manfred Nölte. What do you think about uh, Hossier, the resources? They are erron erroneous themselves. Yes, it, yes, yes, definitely. So I think there also this question of, uh, so this would be definitely one of those data properties where that you need to take into account to get a feeling of what uh, a model is doing on your data. So, uh, and, and there again, the question is, so if you have a deep learning system that can do character and word embeddings, will that do better? Or is it better to first run an, ex, uh, an expertise OCR correction system that is really trained to fix the OCR and hopefully get the quality better? So you get an additional level of, of research questions that are related to the data being OCR'd. But I, I think that is one of the examples so that the, the input data quality is one of those properties of the data that matter a lot. Thank you. The next question is uh, from Marianne Schula. Could you give uh, some examples of what a platform uh, where methodology are shared will look like? And are you thinking of specific protocols similarly to what is developed in the social sciences? Um, yes, I think uh, I think indeed protocols would make a lot of sense um, I, to start with just making sure that uh, when you have something with uh, that where you share a tool to have pointers to things that people can read because it's relatively low threshold. But something that that we've been working on in Claria and that we will also be working uh, on in an European project that we're starting soon with, with some uh, Claren partners also involved. Uh, would be a setup where a user can basically upload a model and they can upload their data and they get information on how that model was evaluated first, but they also get examples of what their data is doing and specifically uh, focused on data that, that in their own data that is very different from the training and evaluation data so that they're encouraged to, to at least see that the tools may make mistakes. And they have this interface of basic that they can use directly to maybe make corrections 
or um, an encouragement to say, okay, it's also good to make completely independent annotations. Can you do this? But of course, uh, creating interfaces like that uh, is a little bit more work. So it is not always feasible. Already we know how much work is involved in making sure that you have dependencies that are more or less stable, that your tools run in the first place. So uh, yeah, anybody who has, has good ideas about that, I'd be very interested. Uh, at, at the moment, I, yeah, I would say the easiest thing is just to share our knowledge in written in, with examples that people know the procedure. Um, but the, my, my main vision is this, this research environment that, that we're trying to build in uh, the work package six of Claria and that's uh, in, in the Antavia project. Uh, so hopefully um, in, a, in a couple of years, we can uh, have a paper in, in Claren that shows that. But I can see other questions. So I have one. I liked your presentation a lot. Uh, I have a question about uh, annotations. Uh, it, it's clear from your talk uh, we are still lacking annotations. Uh, more annotations of quality will give better results. What is uh, your standpoint about uh, how you collect uh, this annotation and how people are collecting by crowdsourcing or uh, against the uh, experts? Yeah. Um, so, so my view is that um, it really depends on the task and how you set it up. Uh, so I've, I've been working with some people who, I don't know if, if people know, uh, know them, but they come from the semantic web community and they have this crowd proof principle. And their stance is the crowd does better than experts. And uh, I think, I mean, for instance, if you have, uh, you want to annotate syntactic parsers, I just don't think that is true. I mean, uh, because there's also, it's very clear, there is like some analysis are correct, others are incorrect. Uh, if you have someone who's trained in linguistics, they'll know what is correct. And just the fact that the crowd agrees more about something that's wrong, um, says more about the, the level of education of the crowd and the education of the grad student than, than of the correctness. But for other things, um, and that's things like sentiment or hate speech or all these things that have subjective elements where maybe even your linguistic glasses are more in the way than that they're helpful. I think that the crowd is a, is a very, uh, very important uh, resource to look at. And um, um, with more and more ways of also correct checking whether the crowdsourcers or the workers are providing correct inputs. Uh, also, there's more attention for having uh, ethical payment for them. Uh, I think actually the crowd is a very important option. Um, and, and I think also we need to realize that there is not always is a crowd truth. Um, in hate speech, I've seen uh, F scores reported from over 80. I just don't think that even people agree so much about something being hate speech. So I, I've talked about it with social science colleagues and they also say, how can that be? So sometimes we may also have a risk of wanting to make our data too clean. And especially for those cases where, where disagreement is meaningful, I think the crowd is a very interesting place to look at. Okay. Yeah, I have uh, a couple of questions. I think we can list each one from uh, Herard Hendricks. Hypothesis testing has a more informal meaning in the sense of pursuing a summer research question, but it also has a more technical sense of hypothesis testing in statistics. It seems that you mostly use the term in the former sense. Do you think that the latter sense would also be of some methodological utility in the context of your talk? Um, yes, most definitely. I think also one of the problems, especially the challenge that I uh, proposed in, in how representative are these results. Well, one of the things, uh, and I, I didn't have time to include that example, is that what we also all know that you see uh, papers claiming that they outperform the state of the art. And the results are very small. And then we also know that a lot of our models are influenced by random elements, such as the initialization of the model, the order in which the examples are presented to the model, things that shouldn't impact the model. So statistic significance testing for, for, for one thing and doing it the right way, which is actually not trivial for the kind of data we're using is, is extremely fundamental. And I have a PhD starting soon uh, on this question of can we actually measure um, the difference between data sets and based on that also have an indication uh, of what the uncertainty is 
of our models on a new data set. So there are, of course, statistics uh, and, and uh, hypothesis testing in a more statistical sense uh, it plays a very big role. And this is also one of the things that uh, if it's really important what the best model is, um, that, uh, that is also very important. And for all of these things, of course, uh, statistical significance and then incorporating the uncertainty of the errors of the model is actually a question where we probably also need to work with experts in statistics and not with just the basic statistics that we, or at least what I got in my, my studies was relatively basic. So, um, yeah. The last question, how much uh, data is enough for the modeling from Eva Suroli? Oh, that's a difficult one. It really depends on uh, on, on what you want to model. Um, so in some research we did for creating language models for more just basic word embeddings, not contextualized ones for English, you get decent performance for from, uh, let's say, over 100 million words corpora onwards, if they are well representative. So if you just want basic language models, uh, especially if you have a language with richer morphology, you might have to do some pre-processing. If there's no pre-processing data available, you need more than that. Uh, but that is kind of the order of magnitude for that. But then for uh, for machine learning for specific tasks, it, it, it depends a lot on the distribution of the classes, uh, how indicative the properties that you can extract are. So that is not a, there's not an easy question. Um, one rule of thumb that I got from a machine learning expert is that you need about 100 times um, the, uh, the amount of data, then you have parameters, which also means that so in a neural network, every connection between two, neur two neurons is a parameter. Uh, that's also the reason why for deep learning, you need so much more data than for uh, more traditional approaches, because you have more parameters. But that's a very uh, rule of thumb uh, approach uh, that of course depends on how strong the correlations are between the input features and the output and all kinds of properties. Okay, thanks a lot. Uh, we are just on time. Uh, so thank you a lot for a very interesting uh, talk and thank you again. Thank you very much all for your attention and for the questions and comments and uh, anybody who has ideas who would like to approach me. Um, I'm uh, very open for that. Thank you very much again. Thank you.